Yes, I was up at 5.30 in the morning, Friday, <laughs> watching the royal wedding take place in London, England. What a grand event that was. Prince William, after years of courtship and uh, a romantic relationship with uh, Kate Middleton, the commoner, uh, finally uh, brought her to Westminster Abbey to be his wife. I got a kick out of the ceremonies to a certain extent. One of the commentators was able to read the lips and think of what uh, Prince William said first to Kate when she came up the aisle. And of course, she was a gorgeous queen, or queen <laughs> princess, as she walked up the aisle. Actually, she was a commoner still at that point, walking up the aisle. But uh, dressed beautifully in white, she approached uh, the altar at the front of the church. And first, as she was approaching Harry, uh, William's brother turned, looked back, and then told her she was coming. And then uh, when she arrived, William turned to look at her for the first time, and he said, you're beautiful. And she was. And uh, then he leaned over to uh, his new father-in-law and said to him, we thought we'd just have a little private gathering of family and friends. <laughs> 1,900 people in the Westminster Assembly, perhaps upwards of 2 billion people around the world lodging in a small gathering of folks. The uh, wedding was uh, interesting in comparison with the former wedding of William's mother, Lady Diana, when she, uh, Diana Spencer, walked up the Isle of St. Paul's Cathedral to meet uh, Prince Charles at the altar. One of the uh, very touching moments in that uh, ceremony was, was when Lady Diana had to repeat uh, her new husband's many names. <laughs> Prince Charles and so forth. I don't know the whole list of names he had, but she got them apparently re reversed. And Who could blame her? <laughs> but uh, on Friday, Kate Middleton got William's names all correct. Everything went fine. Uh, the service itself brought changes to Kate Middleton and to Prince Harry. Uh, excuse me, Prince William. Uh, both of them would be bestowed by the Queen with new titles in uh, British royalty. They would be the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. And so a royal name was given to them. The bishop, in the course of his sermon, his address to them, uh, mentioned that they were given a crown. They were uh, being given uh, the ancient right of Adam and Eve long ago, who became rulers over the heavens, or excuse me, over the earth, subdue the earth and the seas and so forth. And so they were given a new name, they were given a crown, and uh, Prince William turned to his uh, bride and pledged to her his worldly uh, wealth and all of his uh, possessions. Uh, not an inconsiderable sum. I suppose some divorce lawyers are looking at that. <laughs> In any case, uh, quite a, a, a marvelous uh, wedding uh, that we got to see. The Apostle Paul, in writing about marriage and, and weddings, uh, speaks of how earthly marriages are in some sense a reflection of our heavenly union with Christ as His Church. In Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul talks of this wonderful union that husbands have with their wives as a picture of the relationship between Christ and His Church. The Church is His bride, and it is the role of Christ to uh, give Himself up for His bride to win her over to himself, and then to uh, make daily provision for her, sanctifying her, making her holy, spotless, without blemish, a glory uh, to his name. And so there is this earthly picture of this heavenly reality of the relationship between Christ and his church. And with that, the prophet Isaiah would agree Quite often in the prophets you see a comparison made between Israel of old and Yahweh as a marriage relationship. 
Israel is pledged to be married to the Lord, and the Lord is in union with his wife. And it was a rocky marriage, to be sure. Israel was unfaithful in many ways, and she would even be rejected for a period of time, driven out of the house because of her infidel infidelities. But God promised his Israel, his Zion, that heavenly city of Jerusalem, that there would be a time when she would be welcomed back. In fact, a time when they would be married once more, when the Lord would take delight in his bride once more again. And so Isaiah in the 62nd chapter of his book speaks of this great marriage of the people of God with God himself. They are joined to him in a holy partnership. And God himself comes and pledges himself to be their provider. Uh, in the 8th verse of the chapter, God speaks by covenant oath, swearing by his hand, his strong hand and arm, that he will make daily faithful provision for her needs, and no longer will her labors be wasted by other nations coming and uh, uh, stealing her, her provisions. No, the Lord will provide for her and protect and bless her. It is God's covenant oath that establishes his relationship with his people and assures him that he is their Lord. He is wed to them by covenant and he will make full and complete provision for them. And so Isaiah speaks in rather earthly language of the grains of their fields that would be harvested and not be uh, taken away by uh, marauding bands of or raiders from other peoples or nations, but rather their labors or work would be their own to enjoy. The wine of their harvest also will be theirs to enjoy, not just simply in their homes, but most especially in the Lord's own courts. Because after all, when they are married to the Lord, they're brought into His very presence, into His house. They become His bride. So Isaiah is opening our minds to see far more, I think, than just simply the restoration of Israel from Babylon, uh, being returned to the land of Palestine and being rebuilt as a nation once more. There was something of that, but Isaiah had far more in mind. It would be God's provision for his church, for her earthly but spiritual needs. He would feed her clothe her, welcome her into his heavenly courts, and so God would be a faithful husband to his bride. Look at the different ways in which God describes how he would provide for his church, not simply with their food and clothing, as it were, but also with a new name. In the second verse, God speaks of how he would bring or give to his people, or they would be called by a new name. This new name would be reflected in the great changes that take place in their lives. Before they were deserted, before they were desolate, they were uh, divorced, they were with, uh, without the provisions of the Lord any longer. And in these words God describes the, the uh, desperate condition that we all find ourselves in because of our sin. Our rebellion against the Lord brings us into a position of poverty. But God, according to His grace and mercies, brings us back to Himself and places His own name upon us. And so we have a, a new name, a name Hephzibah, or Beulah, which represents that we are the Lord's own possession, that He takes delight in His people. We are the Lord's. When we enter into a marriage relationship, ladies, when you enter into a relationship with your new husband, you take on his name. And he uh, pledges himself to provide for you and to minister to you and to your needs. So the Lord provides a name for us, his own name, which covers us. It's a name of royalty, of glory. 
The Lord also provides uh, with that name a new nature. After all, when we name something, particularly in the scriptures, when we receive a name, it reflects the new nature that we receive. God speaks and we are transformed. We are made new in Christ. We have the new nature wrought within us by the Spirit of God. And that has a name to it. The name of a, of a regenerated soul. And God um, gives us strength now to live before Him as His child. But then, second, note that God provides not only a new name, but also a crown. He gives to them royal authority, splendor, so that they might exercise their proper role as uh, those who would have dominion over the earth. Dominion over themselves, dominion over sin and wickedness, dominion to produce a life of righteousness, of conformity to God's law and advancing God's kingdom in the earth. God blesses His church with a royal crown, giving you authority to do that which is right and good in the world today. It's a crown of beauty and of glory, of splendor. And so when we come to faith in Christ, there is this transformation. Our natures are renewed. We have a new name. We have a new mission or task in life. We are given a crown, which we are to use with the Lord's authority. After all, it is still in His hand. It is the Lord's crown. We do not simply take it for ourselves and assert our authority in any way we please. No, it is the Lord's crown. And so we have a stewardship before the Lord to uh, fulfill. But we are called to service in the Lord's church in this way. What a glorious transformation God has in mind for you and I, beginning here in this life, as He provides us with the help of His Spirit, as He gives us this new nature, as He gives us a new mission in the world today.